to Excel Today with Pastor Afwaka, a weekly broadcast to equip and empower you for all-round excellence in life. Stay tuned and be blessed with this life-transforming teaching. God bless you for being part of today's broadcast. God bless you so much for being part of our broadcast today. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. The entrance of your word brings light and understanding. Let grace rest upon these lips of clay. And let your word come with simplicity, with understanding, and yet with power. Let it bring transformation for everyone that is watching now or may do so thereafter. Thank you that the anointed word brings changes and transformations to your people. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. God richly bless you once again. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. I started a series some time ago, quite a long time ago. It's been ongoing like this for almost two or three months now. And so that's what we've been running with. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, 27. He said, do you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets a prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that would fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. Take note of that word, eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. The King James says that, Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize. Then he says, So run that you may obtain. Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all, but one receives a prize, run that he may obtain. I pray that whatever it is that you are running after this year, that is in line with God's perfect will and program for your life. You will obtain it in Jesus' precious name. So we lay the foundation from the text that God has set a race before us. Every child of God, every person on the planet, there's a race that God has set before us and we are asked to run the race. He said, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with a great cloud of witness, let us run the race that is set before us. Run the race that is set before us. We establish also that there are only two ways to run the race. You are either running to win or you are running in vain. And then we went ahead to establish the fact that to run the race and win in life, there are some three things that are critical that we need to know and understand if you are going to run the race of life and win. Number one, we must understand who we are running with. We must know who we are running with. It's critical and foundational if we must run the race of life and win. And then we also establish that we must know what we are running after because a life is such that everybody is running after something. But whatever you are running after, if it's valuable, you become valuable when you obtain it. But if it's not valuable, by the time you get it, you just run an empty race. And then, of course, we said there are vital laws that govern the race of life. The race of life, just like in every competitive game, there are laws. If you are an athlete, you are running a 100-meter dash or a cross country. The rules that govern it is different from the rules that govern other games. If you are playing, let's say, golf, the rules that govern golf is different from the rules that govern football. So in every game, in every race, in every activity, there are specific laws that govern it. And if you don't understand the laws and you don't live your life or apply yourself to the law, there's no way you're going to get the best out of it. So we establish these things and we talk about who to run with. Under that, we looked at the fact that we need to run with God. Why? Because according to Psalm 18 verse 29, it says, For by you I can run through a through. Without God, you can't run the race of life. And we, God is the source of life. God is the sustainer of life. God is the supplier of everything meaningful and great in life. So we need God. He's a foundation for life. Without him, you can do nothing. That's what we are told, to run with God. And then, apart from running with God, we establish that we need people to run with. If you are going to run the race of life and win, 
We must identify the right people and run with them. The Bible said two are better than one, for they have a good reward for their labor. For if one falleth, one will help his neighbor up. But woe unto him that is alone. A wise man said that if you want to go fast in life, go alone. But if you want to go far, you need to go with people. These are earlier episodes. I took time to recap because I'm going to introduce something new today that we've done. Uh, and the running with others, we captured it from part one all the way to part seven. I encourage you, if you are watching the broadcast for the very, very first time, go back to those episodes and then watch them and your life will certainly not be the same again. Today, we are going to continue and we are reading from Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter two, verse one to three. He says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads. Take note of that word. He may run who reads. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. It will surely come, it will not tarry. It's critical. So it's obvious when you look at verse number two, he said, then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. So today we are going to focus on running with vision. Today, next week, and possibly the week after. We want to focus on running with a vision. Run with a vision. If you are going to run the race of life and win, you need to have a clearly defined vision. A goal, a dream that keeps you alive, a dream that keeps you going. That is vital if you must run the race of life and win. Why is a vision critical? The Bible makes it very clear. In the book of Proverbs 29 verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. In other words, you waste your life, you waste your potential, you waste the talent and the abilities and the gift God has placed in you if there is no vision alive in your spirit. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The New King James says that where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. The word restraint means anything that keeps you from moving outside where you are placed. There is a place where God will have you be uh, function in life. There's a place for you in life. I like it when the Bible says, let every man abide in the calling, wherein he is called. There's a specific place God will have you be. And if you don't see yourself, you don't function in that space, you don't function in that place, there is no way the very best that God has placed in you can be released for your world to benefit from it. That's why it's important that we identify that place. And vision is a thing that helps you to be able to identify your unique calling, your unique assignment in life. What's a vision? When we talk about a vision, I'm going to share with you two definitions that I believe will help you. One is that a vision is a mental picture of a preferred or a desired future. A mental picture of a preferred or a desired future. That's a vision. Look at Genesis 13, 14 to 15. And the Lord said to Abraham, after Lord had separated from him, he said, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. All the land you see, all the land you see, foresight, the ability to see into the future. That is vision. Your ability to strategically plan into the future. That is vision. He said, all the land you see, I will give you. All the land you see. Anything you don't see, God is not obliged to give it to you. All the land you see, God will always show you the place he wants you to be before he brings you there. It is in the nature of God to always give you a foretaste of where he wants you to be. If you are Joseph, he will come to you in a dream. If you are Abraham, he will tell you, step out of your father's house, go to a place which I will show you. He would always 
If you are Joshua or Moses leading Israelites from captivity into Cana, he will tell you, go and spy out the land. That's what vision is. Vision helps you to see the future and then you come back into the present to work it out. That is how powerful vision is. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 4. And they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now look at verse number 6. The Bible said, And the Lord came down to look at what people were doing. And he said, Behold, the people is one. And the thing which they have imagined to do. Vision has to do with imagination. Vision has to do with forming mental images of the future that God has designed or program for you. you never forget it. He said, I know the plans I have for you. Plans of good and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. You need to see that future if you must possess that future. It is important that you see the future. I said many years ago that a future you cannot see is not a future you can feature in. A future you cannot see is not a future you can feature in. It's important that you see the future. The future must be seen. It is your ability to see the future that will inform your present behavior. If you are behaving in a loose manner, if you are behaving in a hopeless manner, if you are behaving as if there is nothing ahead, it's because you've not seen anything in the future. A vision is critical. The Bible says God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, Above all that we can ask or imagine. That's why he gave you the mind to be able to imagine yourself into his plan and program for your life. So a vision is a mental picture of a preferred future. I like the second definition. He says, a vision is a picture of the future that produces passion for pursuit or accomplishment. A vision is a picture and I'm using picture because that's what it is. Vision, your eyes were given to see. And when you see the images that you form in your mind becomes a vision that governs your life. He says, it's a picture of the future that produces passion for pursuit or accomplishment. You don't just want to have a picture, but the picture must be compelling enough. The picture must be beautiful enough that it will move you out of your comfort zone. It will inspire you to have to run. That is the kind of vision we're going to talk about. Look at what the Bible says in Habakkuk. Habakkuk 1 and 2, he said, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon my tower and I will watch to see. I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. And the Lord said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that read it. That is passion for pursuit. That is passion for accomplishment. When the vision is clear in your spirit, it produces passion. It produces a zeal for pursuit. So a vision is a picture of the future that produces, induces, provokes passion for you to pursue and to accomplish. You look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 to 6. God came to Abraham at a time where Abraham spoke in a very discouraging manner. He was almost giving up on God's plan and program for his life. God had to bring him to a place where he would give him a fresh picture of the future he had promised him. And so let's read it and see how that shaped the man's life. Genesis 15, verse 1 to 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, do not be afraid. Abraham, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless. That was what Abraham was seeing. He wasn't seeing what God would have him see. What was Abraham supposed to see? God told him, Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations. In you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you and your seed. But Abraham said, See, I go childless. He saw himself childless when God had made him a father of many nations. What are you seeing about yourself? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself hopeless? Do you see yourself as someone whose future is bleak? Do you see yourself as if there is no 
hope in your future. The Bible says God has a plan for you and it's a good plan. It's a plan to take hold of the future and it's a plan to prosper you. That is God's plan. And that's what you must see. When you see what God has spoken or what God has revealed concerning you, you cannot do anything but act the way God expects you to act. God came to Abraham and he said, The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, that is the word that came to him in a vision, saying, this shall not be your heir, but one who will come out from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him, I want you to follow this, he brought him outside. God is a God of visions. He brought Abraham outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars. That's a picture. Count the stars. If you are able to number them, this man has no child and God is giving him an overwhelming vision. He says, count the stars. If you are able to number them and he said, so shall your descendants be. Abraham says, I am childless. God says, your descendants are going to be like the stars in the heavens. Beautiful. The Bible says, Abraham believed. Look at verse 6. He believed in the Lord and he accounted to him for righteousness. What Abraham saw, provoked something in him. He moved from a place of fear to a place of faith. He moved from a, a place of frustration to a place where there was clarity and a sense of purpose and hope. That is Abraham. He saw a picture that changed his paradigm and his perspective in life. It's critical we appreciate that vision is powerful in this life. If you are going to be all that God will have you be, you need a compelling vision to live your life in a very meaningful way. There are two kinds of visions you must run with. If you are going to run and win in life, you need two kinds of visions. And don't forget, when we talk about winning, we are not just talking about winning on the earth. That is great, but you must win on the other side as well because we live life on two planes and our shortest life is live on the earthly realm. And so we must seek to win, not just here, but win on the other side. In all of eternity, no matter your accomplishment on the earth, if you win on earth only and you don't win there, you are the greatest of all losers. Okay? So two kinds of vision you must run with. Number one is what I call heavenly vision. That's what the scriptures actually call it. Heavenly vision. Look at Acts chapter 26 verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. There is something called heavenly vision. Heavenly vision. Heavenly vision. Heavenly vision. I will come back to talk to you about heavenly vision. Because it's a very powerful thing. There are a lot of people who only live with earthly vision. They have no heavenly vision. So you need a heavenly vision. Heavenly vision. A heavenly vision is a kingdom driven vision. Look at Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven. From which also we eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are told from the scriptures that we are ambassadors on earth. Our citizen is in heaven. And that makes us ambassadors on the earth. And as heavenly ambassadors on the earth, we can never come to a place where we lose the vision of our home country. There's a vision heaven has for us. There's a vision heaven will have us accomplish. There's a vision that God would have us pursue while we function on the earth realm. Many people go through life. They live 50 years, 20 years, uh, 40 years, 80 years, 100 years, and they live their lives pursuing only an earthly vision. They never, some people don't even know that there's a heavenly vision that we've been called to. But I want you to appreciate that the, the foremost vision you must pursue in life is a heavenly vision. That is foundational. That is fundamental. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He said, Dear friends, you are foreigners and strangers on this earth. Take note, we are foreigners and strangers in the earth. And so we need vision to guide us. How? We ought to live our lives. So he says, so I beg you not to surrender to those desires that fight against you. 
We are strangers. We are here for a short time. And because we are here for a short time, we must keep the vision of our home country in perspective. And that's why I challenge you that you will not just capture a vision to accomplish a lot on the planet. It's great. And I'm going to talk about that because God has an assignment for us right here on the earth. I always say that when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior and you sleep the next day and you are up, God is saying that he needs you on earth. He has an assignment for you to do on earth before you come on the other side. So heavenly vision is foundational. Heavenly vision is kingdom driven. Heavenly vision is eternity driven. Kingdom focus and eternity driven. That is heavenly vision. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you. In the book of Matthew 6, 19 to 20, he said, don't store up treasures on earth. Moths and rust can destroy them. And thieves can break in and steal. Instead, store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy them. And thieves cannot break in and steal them. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to 8. He says, I like this text so much, Apostle Paul. Having come to the end of his life and ministry, made a very profound statement. This is what he said. He said, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. And that day will come, that time will come for everyone on the planet except those who by the grace of God will have the privilege of living till Christ comes. But other than that, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 80 years from now, 40 years from now, most of you who may be watching me may not be alive you would have departed. And Paul said, the time for my departure is at hand. So he had finished his assignment on the earth and he's about to cross into eternity. Look at what the man said. He said, I've fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Look at verse number eight. That's why I like so much. He said, henceforth, there is laid up for me. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day only, and not unto me only, but unto all those who love his appearing, all those who kept the heavenly vision in perspective. In the book of Acts, an angel came and told them, he said, this same Jesus whom you see go up into the heavens, he shall come back to you. This same Jesus go up into the heavens, and the heavenly vision should never be lost out on us. We can become so earthly minded, earthly so overwhelmed by our earthly pursuits that we can easily lose track of the heavenly vision. You will not lose track of the heavenly vision. So that's number one, is a heavenly vision. And then number two, we also need an earthly vision. An earthly vision. The Bible talks about those who mind earthly things. In the book of Philippians chapter 3 verse 19, he says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Who mind earthly things? There are people whose focus is earthly things. And to some degree, we, 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 we can't just all the time be focusing on heavenly things. That, that has been uh, put in its right perspective. This context was used to mean something negative. But of course, it's important we appreciate that God has an assignment for us here on the earth. If you read the book of Genesis, it makes it very clear there. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. He says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the face of the sea, over the fire of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth. Take note, that is the first time the earth is mentioned, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image, in the image of God created him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth the third time, and subdue it, and have dominion over the sea, over the fire of the earth, and over every creeping thing that moved upon the face of the earth. When God made man, he gave him a location, and that location was on the earth. And he told him, function here, be fruitful here, be flourish here, excel here, have dominion here. That was part of man's assignment. So, while we are on the earth, we need to have an earthly vision. 
And it's a vision to command dominion. It's a vision to bring kingdom influence on the earth. It's a vision to impart our wealth positively. That vision is also very, very vital. You remember in the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, Jesus was speaking to his uh, disciples. He said, you are the salt, not of heaven, but of the earth. You are the light of the world. That is it. God has an assignment for us on the planet. And we need to discover that, walk in the fullness of it, and be able to excel at it. How powerful is a vision? How powerful is a good vision? That is what we are going to be exploring from next week. A good vision is so powerful. There is nothing literally that can be compared to the power in a good vision. A good vision is powerful. Everything that the man Joseph became, he became it because he had a vision or a dream. Everything he became. The Bible says, where there is no vision. Now, if you want to know how powerful something is, you want to know what happens if that thing is absent. And the Bible clearly tells us, where there is no vision, a people perish. Now, if vision is that powerful, such that without it you perish, then you should know that it's very, very powerful. Where there is no vision, people don't forsake. Where there's no vision, people don't get frustrated. They perish. And I know you don't want to perish. I pray that by the time we are through with this series, you will capture a compelling vision, both for eternity and for the earth that we are operating and functioning on right now. God richly bless you for being part of our broadcast today. I look forward to having you join me same time next week as we continue on this interesting series, Run to Win and particularly run with a vision. God bless you. I look forward to having you join me same time next week. Till I see you same time next week, maximize the grace of God. I love you. You are blessed. It's great having you to be part of today's broadcast. Join us same time next week Saturday on the same channel for another insightful moment on Excel Today with Pastor Afwafa. You are gladly invited to fellowship with the Embassy of Life Chapel family for our good news services on Sunday across our respective branches for a life-changing experience. You can also be part of the service online on this same channel. Remain blessed and have a 